Maybe he's got a phone. I've got a phone, yes. I'm uh, Stephen Edwin Lundgren. I'm E. Ballard, as opposed, as you should think, from the Swedish name. And um, I remembered earlier today that I used to lift a uh, copy from Paul in the 60s when I uh, was writing an underground newspaper in my high school when we would go over to Seattle and liberate the Helix and just steal things. So, um, I, whatever, thank you for that, and we're not going to pay your royalties. Um, and I next met him uh, later in the 60s when we had somebody living at our campus in Bellingham who was doing something, which apparently turned out to be Gary Snyder drunk in the back of the truck in Fairhaven, which was the Arts Festival. But hey, what a deal. One of your many successful no, endeavors. I, think, I don't think it was, uh, I think it was uh, one flew over the focus nest. Ah, okay. He had to be there to know. He was drunk, and he was in uh, Paul Sawyer's van. Ah, okay. <laughs> and some of us probably knew that at the time, but... Um, you might have, yeah. Ah, one of the things about being a local historian is that we do works which are so obscure that only another historian would appreciate them. And this is a typical book I bought today because this cover is really cool. It's like wood grain. Wow. And it is a history of the Mendocino County in North California, self-published, like... Um, your publications yeah. were yeah. in 1948. And if you want to know anything about North California lumber industry, here's the book. And you those want to, uh, memories should have them signed. Uh, I'll, I'll find the author and have them sign it. Right. These are labors of love for those of us who do local history. We need to know that you know everything about Fremont, whether you care or not. But there's a history there. Or you need to know that these two kids are standing in South Lake Union in 1905, just enjoying the time. He's talking about the picture on the cover of Seattle Now and Then, Volume 1. A uh, lovely picture that uh, actually paid for our survival for a couple, three years. Indeed. So those images that we pull out of the past are essential because they're us. They're in our time. They're me at the beach in 1951, splashing in the water in a place that may or may not exist any further. So um, one of the things that Paul has done for many of us is just to bring back the memories. So the, the core envoy, um, and this is an 80th Geburtstag Geschrift here for Paul, but in French it's is for us to uh, to deliver an envoy to Paul. So this is one of three envoys I've written for Paul. The envoy de une flaneur luxe. And I'm sorry if my French is shrekelish. <laughs> Each street, avenue, alley beckoned. Passerbys did not register, or ghosts. Exposure far too long for evanescences. Come back later when the light's better. 20, 40, 60 years perhaps. Houseman's Boulevards, Gessler's Avenues remain gun straight. Flash powder drifted away like mists. Shop window mannequins still wink at the sailors. Paul's lens remains open to all. This is Front Street, Seattle, 1890, 2019. Two to go. <laughs> Envoy la femme et femelle. Within the chamber lights, light plain challenging, shadows upon her undulous forms. I was at Sky River no. with five girls. <laughs> Venus rising in perpetual rebirth. Then it became clear she was always now Voyager. <laughs> and summation. The archive becomes chaos, muse, born from his head, like Zeus. All seen, often known, mysteries. Who might have been she in the field? Zephyr came lightly, then flew away. All we've known were shown. Collected truths, proofs, fictions, photographs. Tales told best as recalled. Inscripted. The columns, you know, still standing in their glade. Even as the prince have faded, somewhere Olympus raged. The gods await us. Then and now. Well, there you are. That's very. Good. <laughs> <laughs> he, he tells us. 
70, we connected when I had all my money stolen at Washougal after, after swimming and skinny dripping in the river. My car had broken down, and somebody had given me a hit of acid, and I camped in Paul's camp. That was a great experience. I did not give him the acid. <laughs> Paul, did you ever take acid? Twice. He huh? can't remember the yeah. But if you can remember the 60s, you probably weren't there. <laughs> but Paul, I've always admired Paul. Uh, I, I, I felt that one of the first things I did after meeting him and connecting with him was to give him all the money I had in the world to buy a movie camera so that we could make this guy a movie. Uh -oh, which is still in progress, right? <laughs> and, uh, some of, many of you have seen clips of that in some form or another over the last well, It'll be a great years. film, though. Don't it you agree? Be great film. Yes. It'll be a great film. There's thousands of feet of footage. So I absolutely admire Paul. I, I revered Paul, I would say. He was somebody we shared of some of the same background. Oh. Uh, good Walter Lee. That's the new Missouri Senate who comes in the first half of the references to. It was amazed me that you would ever have gone to a Walter Lee meeting. That was the president of the Walter Lee. Oh. <laughs> some of us don't remember that. Yeah, that's were there. Uh, oh, boy. So Paul, I shared a lot of those same things. I really admired them. There was a time when we shared a house, a funky little house in what was the Cascade neighborhood close to the Middle Seattle Times building. And one thing I think it's important to remember about Paul is not just his seriousness and his ability to master all this knowledge, is the other side of Paul, the trickster side of Paul. Uh, I remember coming home one night and Paul, as he was his wife, was listening to the Sonic scene. And really? <laughs> and as soon as I walk in, Paul says, here's the score. Listen, who, are you going to bet the Sonics are going to win by 15 points? They were ahead by a bunch of points. And, he really, and I don't bet on things, but he really pushed me to do this. Okay, I finally took the bet. Well, the game was pre-recorded. He knew the score. <laughs> the thing is, about two weeks later, he did the same thing. And, I went <laughs> and this is Paul. To me, did you, this, did this, you fall for it twice? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I always think of you as uh, in, in uh, unusually bright and sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> I can advise that. Now, but that's part of Paul's uh, charm. I think those of you who work with him, whether on the Helix or whatever, Paul has an ability to enthuse other people, to take their enthusiasm and turn it into something, but not necessarily to do all the work, to find people, get them going, and and give them responsibility for things. And I think that's an important thing. But I think it's also important to remember that, that Paul, as, a, as, as that powerful figure, also has that ability. And I think it's very important to be the trickster, to see that other side of life, and to make us think about what we're doing and how we do it. And that's what I think about many of his columns in the, in the Times on the history of Seattle, and the view of the city as, as it grew. Especially the one about um, Ivor Hagman's uh, Underwater billboard. <laughs> I'll let you. I'll let you cover that. No, no, we won't cover that. While you're talking, I'm looking into the faces of all the people who are listening to you to see whether there's any truth in what you're saying and whether there are people Whether they light up in the proper way. <laughs> But I'm here, I, I live in California now, and I'm here to honor Paul and to share my respect, my ongoing respect for him, and my hope that he has a wonderful future ahead of him. I, I, he is... Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I don't think so. I know, that's why I'm saying this. I'd like three years, though. We talk about this fairly often, and I'm, 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 
I'm the argu argument for taking care of myself and doing what you can to live long. I'm starting my diet tomorrow. Honest. <laughs> Honest, man. But also, while we were living in that house, and this is the lead up to his 40th birthday, the minute yeah. he was either there or seen pictures of him. That's for a life ago. And so he pledged sometime a few months before that that he was going to lose 50, 60 pounds, whatever it was. More than that. What's it more than that? Uh, lose weight. That at that party he was going to smoke his last cigarette because he was a fairly heavy smoker. He was going to get his hair cut and get his beard shaved off. This was all part of his growth. He wasn't going to be a hippie anymore. He lost that weight. We lived next to a little park in the Cascade District. He ran around that park every day. He changed his diet. He was eating carrots and you know, really healthy food. I had he, teeth then. He had teeth. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was a fine figure of a man. For a while. And he agreed with that. was sweet of him to say that. <laughs> so he's capable of that kind of discipline. He has a goal right now in terms of losing some weight. Give some, give some ease to his knees. And stuff. Yeah, I have to do it for my knees. How many of you have bad knees? Raise your hands. You? <laughs> Most of you have bad knees. Don't you? Does that make you feel better? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see this side of the room. How many bad knees over on this side of the room? Quite a few. <laughs> so anyway, I, I talked to Paul about his future because I wanted to take that seriously. And I think that you people here tonight, you friends of Paul, you people who have seen him over the years, can reinforce that. I don't want him to give up on what his future is going to be. Maybe there could be an 85th birthday. Maybe there could. And Baron Jerry would probably come from Paris. Would you come from Paris? <laughs> Bibi, would you come from Paris? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 You know, she, I mean, she'd be the only game for this, for this event. Uh -huh. yeah. so, that's my semi road <laughs> This all is very familiar to me because for about 25 years, and I'm not exaggerating, well, maybe, I may be, but <laughs> for 20 years, every spring, I would lecture to the Daughters of the Pioneers, and right at this spot, and there was a little stage right there, and, and then we had a, they were my girlfriends, and they called me their boyfriend, so... It was wonderful, really. It went on and on and on until the organization, because of its age, started to dwindle. So the last time I was there was about five years ago. It was here, I mean. But we had a good time, delightful time, all those years. And I would mix it up so they had to use their intelligence, their family history, to try to figure things out. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. I have, I have one story to tell, and I told a piece of it today at our book launch. But the story is essentially that uh, I, I can draw a line directly from the actual voice of God to the voice of Dorcat. That's true. And the line that is drawn is there's there's two short portions of this. First of all, Paul and I about 15 years ago. Uh, for made a, uh, a version, a radio version of uh, Gift of the Magi for Felix Bunnell. He had a Christmas show on, on uh, the Bellevue Community Radio Station. Paul was the narrator. And one of the parents of a student of mine called me up hearing Paul's narration and said, my good God, I've just heard the voice of Reverend Dorpat, <laughs> who was, Pastor Dorpat was the, was the Lutheran pastor in Spokane, where Paul spent most of his time. Kind of the bishop. So and the, she, the church didn't have bishops, but he was really the... He was a profound, yeah. and, and he evidently had an extraordinarily powerful voice, just as Paul does. And he so didn't this, have much to say, <laughs> but he said it with great, great, Every edition and, and polish. Yeah. So the reason that it's the voice of God is because Paul's closest friend from childhood, Jack Arkles, uh, had a, uh, uh, a, a near-death experience where he, his heart actually stopped and he died and returned. And the uh, as he and he related this to Paul, and and as he was as he was ascending to 
to his Lutheran heaven, he heard the voice of God saying, it's not time yet, and it was the voice of Reverend Dorpat. Or Paul. Actually, or Paul. He yeah. turned around and saw that. Did he? He saw yeah, that? Yeah, he felt his arms go around him. Then he turned around and, and, and Dad said, it's not time yet, Jack. It's not time yet. You have to stay. Yeah. So, <laughs> Praise the Missouri Senate Lutheran. In fact, we're going to have a seminar on that later tonight. And I'm prepared for it. I hope you are. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Is that it then at the program? No. Huh? We're all done. Okay. Uh, well, I thank you very much, all of you, for coming. I, I, I think I look across this, this field of faces and think how much, uh, how fortunate I've been to have so many really good friends, and I'm independent on them consistently. And what are you pointing at? Are you pointing at him? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Keep talking. No, that'll do. That'll do. Never mind. <laughs> Paul, I met you in 2003 after my colleague suggested that you could, might do a, a column on my house that I had just finished restoring. Right. And I invited you to my house. Yes. And it's like you'd always been there. And um, and I and I had so much fun working with you. And then I got laid off half time at the end of the year. And rather than get, continue to be very upset about it, I decided to take on a project. Great line, where are you? Here. Yeah, there you are. So I decided to take on a project I've been thinking about for a year or two, and that was to go over to the Puget Sound Regional State, uh, Regional Branch of the State Archives, to take photographs of everything they had of Fremont in 1937 and their Works Progress Administration collection. And so I did manage to do that in 11 weeks. Now I had a foundation to start a historical society for Fremont, which I did in 2004. And um, uh, I called you Paul, you came to our founding meeting, and you gave us uh, things to research, mystery photos. You came and did a, a lecture for free for us at the Fremont Library. I think I over 200 people free. came. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm aligned with you there. I think history should be free. Yeah. So um, I started taking money recently. Though. <laughs> so, uh, but I, but Paul, if anyone I know, I think you're probably one of the very most generous souls that I know. I'm very grateful. Aren't you? Isn't that sweet of you? No, I, I'm completely. Is anybody recording this, by the way? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, so I, I, Paul. Yes, I'm looking at you. I want to I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the support you have given, yeah. and uh, including giving us really huge photos to display at the Fremont right. Fair and our booth. Yes, yes, yes. And then you've been a very cheerful presence in the Pike Place Market Historical Society, right. which I started a couple years ago. Anyone from the Market Historical Society here? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you, Paul. The Power Trust. The the. Pike Place Markets Power Trust is in the room with us right now. Okay? You'll have to find it on your own, though. So it's kind of hidden. Go ahead. That's all I had to say. Well, thank you very much, Heather, and you've been a great help in so many different ways for me, too. You've been a very good friend. That's the most important thing. And, uh, you know, you make history. <laughs> And there's Tom Gunn. Yeah. And what's it? Is that the cat dog? Uh, King. So we're putting Paul to bed. <laughs> well, that's very sweet. There's a wonderful tradition in uh, uh, that I've experienced in, in Native American communities in which the birthday boy or girl has a blanket spread around them or under them. In this case, we'll just spread around. And in place of uh, giving them vast quantities of, of, uh, of presents to carry home, which Paul might or might not prefer, or chocolates, 
He doesn't need any more presents. He doesn't need any more presents. Marilyn knows. Marilyn knows. She lives around the corner of the hall. And she's been involved in the collection and gathering. Wait a second. Wait a second. Who is that speaking about? Marilyn. Marilyn's my neighbor. Don't listen to her. She lives down the street. She knows she's too much. All right, enough of the praise. Oh, is that just supposed to be a roast or something? <laughs> really, honestly, concerning the birthday, this wonderful person does not need more things. Right. So just give best wishes, uh, give heavily at the basket at the door, and purchase the book. I'm not cold. <laughs> Yes, so, uh, my, my plan, if you read your invitation, and if you didn't, you know, it's, it's said, that rather than bring the, if you read the invitation, my suggestion was that Paul, whose computer is on its very last legs, really is. Yeah. needs a replacement, and we, we were thinking that on the launch of the new book, that to give a couple of bucks to Paul, he will do, I'm thinking, I was thinking a little dance. Maybe three or four bucks, maybe? Three or four, you know, up to ten. But what I'm thinking is maybe if we could play a little a little musical interlude and we can come up and every, you, as you give him your 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 contribution, I'll start. Did anybody come with money? Actually, did you even yes. come with money? I came with oh my bucks. goodness, I, my cup on the over or nearly might. <laughs> uh, let's, let's, let's check some people here. Uh, let's see. Did you come with money? Uh, Sheila, so here we go. I'm coming to kiss you, Paul. She did. Wow. My goodness. Did you come, son? Did you come? <laughs> I'm going to tell you how much each one gave. I got some, <laughs> I got some change from your phone. Yeah. $20. $5. And you're a poet. That's all it's I'm a blank one. Thank you very much. Okay, now I'm going to tell you how much this is. Uh, <laughs>
Sneezes. Uh, he didn't sneeze. Robert!